Okay, today we're going to hear about the Community Food Bank. Uh, food Bank had its origins right in, uh, started right in Summit. Um, I will introduce uh, Joe Dempsey, and then jo Joe will in turn uh, introduce his colleagues. Joe is a graduate of uh, Dartmouth, and he's president of the uh, Dartmouth Club, the Alumni Association for this area. Joe organizes a lot of charity events, and that's how I came to meet him. Joe has also been on the board at the Food Bank for 15 years. Um, he currently is vice chair, so he has a lot of knowledge going a long, long time back. Okay, before Joe, uh, speaks, have a funny story, which has a serious uh, note to it. Back in the late 80s, uh, Pat signed me up for loaves and pitches, fishes at uh, St. Teresa's. Loaves and fishes was started by Kathy Shearer, uh, who later on went on to start the food bank. Uh, they assigned me two ladies in the senior, citizen, senior citizens' housing complex. Mrs. Shambly was a very nice, reserved lady. Uh, she was about 79. Mrs. O'Neill was much more out, outgoing. Uh, she was 93. So, of course, at 93, I thought uh, that this won't be for long. So, uh, I would meet Mrs. Mo, uh, McNeil, bring her food to her, and we would sit down and we would solve the world's problems together. Uh, by the way, she had a very sharp mind. Uh, we failed on that score. But Mrs. McNeil went on to live to be 103. So this uh, short-term project uh, went on for 10 years. <laughs> The moral there is watch out what you sign up for. <laughs> <laughs> On a serious note, though, the whole food situation has changed tremendously in the last uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, back then, we were feeding people who were on a fixed income. Now it's totally different. I'll hand it all over to Joe, Carlos, and Lauren. Uh, thank you, Michael. I'll be very brief. Um, Michael and I started talking about uh, doing something a, a few months ago, and at the time I thought it would be a small breakfast gathering. Um, I, I'm happy to do that, and as I kind of learn more about the opportunity and, and the occasion, uh, I really thought if, if you want to learn about food insecurity uh, in New Jersey and what the, food, the Community Food Bank of New Jersey is doing about it, the really the best person to have talk to you uh, was Carlos Rodriguez, who's our CEO and president. Uh, we also have Lauren Snyder here, too, who's our volunteer resources coordinator. Um, but really, you know, Carlos, for the last almost 30 years now, uh, has been solely focused on food security, being an advocate for food security. And, and not only it's just it's not just about food, but there's also components to it as well, that, that how do you improve people's lives and make them more food secure? So with that, I will leave it to uh, Carlos to go with the slides. Thank you, Joe and, uh, and Michael for the introduction and kind of setting up the stage a little bit. I'm gonna try my hand at tech here and sharing the screen. Start off successfully then, and let's see if we can end that way. As Joe mentioned, uh, I've had the privilege of working on the issue of food security and income support for just about 30 years. It's something that I temporarily started after college uh, as a way to give back. So Michael, I can appreciate how some short-term things can become a long-term lifetime of, of experiences. Uh, I'd like to talk just a little bit about uh, the organization and what we do, but I'd like to start first by 
rooting ourselves in the understanding of what the problem is that this not-for-profit Community Food Bank of New Jersey is, is looking to solve. And so we talk about the hungry, it's very easy to, to understand, uh, but I wanna dive a little deeper in an understanding of what the problem is, talk a little bit about what we do as an organization, and then invite you to be a part of the solution. And Lauren will be here to facilitate some of those opportunities as well. So let's talk when we say, as, as Michael said, it's grown over and it's changed tremendously over the last uh, 30 to 40 years. Today, right now in New Jersey, there are no less, no less than 650,000 New Jerseyans that are what we call food insecure. And I'll define that for you a little later. Of them, we have 175,000 that are children. That includes 70,000 residents uh, in South Jersey, the three counties that we directly serve in South Jersey, and 20,000 children down there, which is close to, in some counties in the South, close to a, a little higher than 12% of the population in some cases, which is way above the state and kind of national average. We just came out of a pandemic, so let's put it in context. But the number of food insecure was high before the pandemic. And it actually was almost as high or a little higher than the numbers that I just read out. What's concerning is that what we've learned about the problem of food insecurity is that it takes at least 10 years, or it has taken at least 10 years after a major economic downturn for the numbers to go back down to where they were before any major economic downturn. So think about the Great Recession in 2008. We had a big spike uh, of food insecure New Jerseyans. And, um, and then it took to about 2018 or so, uh, 2019, before we saw the numbers kind of dip down to all of those pre-recession pre levels. A part of the reasons for that, it takes families uh, a longer time to climb out of economic hardship than it does, um, than it does I think, for, for other folks. Um, and food insecurity plays a, a key part in that. So what does it mean to be food insecure? I'm turning, throwing this term around. Well, what we say, what we mean with food insecurity, and this is a, a widely held, nationally accepted uh, definition, is that there's, when we say someone is food insecure, there's a lack of access to adequate food to sustain an active and healthy lifestyle. So think about that. It's just quite frankly, knowing where your next meal is gonna come from and that that meal is gonna serve you to the needs that you have as an individual and as a family. The condition of food insecurity can be episodic or chronic. I miss a meal because I didn't have uh, any money this week or for this next immediate meal or it could be something that I'm doing with for a period of time. And that period of time can be long, uh, very long. It can show up in different ways, skimping on the nutritional quality of the food or the quantity of the food. Think about a parent who goes without eating so their children uh, can have enough food. A uh, parent can be food insecure in order to be able to make sure that the children are food secure. Uh, it can be experienced by definition, by, by example, uh, that I just gave by some members of the households, but not as others. Uh, and one of the things that we learn is that uh, the first thing that falls off the proverbial table is the nutritional quality of food, which has other devastating consequences. Empty calories are the cheapest and the most filling. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So food insecurity exists also among people who have no income, and as well as those who have insufficient income. In fact, and Michael, Michael alluded to it in his research, uh, many of the families that we serve today are working, have at least one person in the household that is working at least part of the year. So many of the food insecure households uh, in New Jersey uh, have at least one member of the household that's working. Many, in fact, are they're not what we want to conjure or imagine. And, and the reason that there's insu insufficient is because I think probably um, uh, something that you can appreciate from your, your Bridges presentation last earlier in the month is rent eats first. And when you think about high costs of living and other things that you must do, or there's an immediate uh, consequence or effect or something even more difficult, it's much harder to climb out of homelessness than it is to 
maybe let me not eat the right way right now, or maybe let me go without a meal. Um, and I think that's, that's part of the dynamic, especially in a high cost of living area like we are here. Let me um, talk a little bit about the effects of being food insecure and not having enough to eat. And you can see it in society all around us. A uh, person's social behavior and emotional wellness um, is, is compromised. They're not able to deal with stressful situations. A student's ability to learn and focus in school is also compromised. So a lot of behavior issues in school sometimes are attributed to just not having enough to eat or being hungry. A person's physical, emotional, and social preparedness for the workplace is compromised. So you're not as prepared to go to work if you don't have enough uh, nutrition or not food secure. A child's developmental uh, stage is affected, especially in the first five years of life. So it has long lasting effect if you're food insecure very early in life. And a family's health, uh, those without enough food are more likely to suffer from chronic conditions and or be hospitalized more frequently than others. Uh, and also, a, and not just the individual or the household, but the whole sense of community, a community's well-being uh, is determined by, as it's determined by the productivity of its member, is also compromised. So if you think of 650,000 New Jerseyans not being food secure, well, what does that do in terms of us living as a community to our fullest potential if we have such a large percentage of the population uh, compromised that way? There is a difference between hunger and food insecurity. We sometimes use the word interchangeably, but it's not. Hunger is a condition that you feel. You don't have breakfast, I go a little long afternoon, and you start feeling hungry. That's a condition. Food insecurity is when you don't know how long or how or if you're going to be hungry. You have no prospect of being able to get food. So hunger is a symptom of food insecurity uh, is another way to think about it. But they're not, they, are relate, they have a relationship, but it's, they're not interchangeable. Uh, we don't just want to alleviate hunger at the Community Food Bank of New Jersey. We want people to be food secure as they should be in an area of such abundance and a society of such abundance. So where do food banks fit in? And where does the Community Food Bank of, of uh, New Jersey fit in as families find themselves from being food insecure to being less food secure. So let's talk a little bit about how most folks, hopefully you and I, uh, maintain food security. For the most part, it's income, whether it's work income, retirement income, more than half of all food secure individuals have, or, or food insecure individuals actually, as I mentioned, have income above the poverty level. And most of us enjoy just using our income to go out and shop and make ourselves and all of our needs whole through that way. Um, if you can't, when that falls short, uh, there's benefits or community benefits, I should say. Uh, helping a neighbor, very short term, very immediate, someone has a unexpected bill or crisis, neighbors usually help themselves, help each other. Uh, public benefits is another strong way that of safety net of supports. The SNAP program is really the first line of defense, formerly known as food stamps. And it's actually there primarily for working families. And, for, and you have to actually show that if you're working, you're, you're, if you can work, you're working, um, or you're in a work search uh, process in order to be eligible for SNAP benefits. And many people don't know that. So we actually help orient on that. Uh, so the SNAP benefit is really the first line of defense. In addition to that, WIC, the WIC program for uh, expecting mothers and, and children that are born under, up to and under the age of five, and then there's a host of other meal programs that are government run, school meals, summer meals, and some of them are run in partnership with not-for-profit like ours. So, and when all of these things fail, then comes the food bank or are inadequate. So the fact that we have to do as much to help shore up and make a family whole really speaks to the policy and the societal problem that we're dealing, that the 650,000 New Jerseyans are dealing with. It is what some would term an economic failure or a market failure. There is food all around us. People want it. They just can't reach it um, for, any, for, for reasons that have to do uh, with income access for, for the most part. So that's an interesting perspective because if you know that this is how many families and individuals cascade down and find their ways into the community food bank's network of services, 
uh, then it also serves as a roadmap on how to get folks back up and how to create that economic mobility right back up to folks. So let's talk a little bit about Community Food Bank of New Jersey, if, we will, if you will. We serve 15 of New Jersey's 21 counties, uh, moving, through, uh, moving, moving food and services through two, two main headquarters, our main one in, uh, Egg, in Hillside, not too far from here, uh, and then another uh, location in Egg Harbor, anchoring the services that we provide in the three southern uh, counties that we serve. And we also are part of a larger network. First here in New Jersey, we work with uh, two affiliate food banks and two sister food banks that serve the other six counties of the, of the, that, the sister food banks that serve six other counties uh, here in, in New Jersey. We are part of a national network coordinated through Feeding America, uh, which is a national kind of umbrella organization that food banks created probably 40 or so years ago. Uh, we really focus on maximizing our resources with over 95 cents of every dollar going to, uh, of every dollar and every, every resource that we attain going right to programs and into the community. And we are a recognized four-star charity uh, on Charity Navigator. What do we produce uh, with that investment and that trust and to help families kind of rise back up to, to economic mobility uh, to a place where hopefully they can enjoy shopping the way you and I enjoy shopping. What we provide because of this increased need and uh, as a direct response to the pandemic and the, the long work in front of us because of the pandemic, we provide enough food to support 85 million meals a year. 85 million meals a year. Just before the pandemic, when I first started about five years ago at the Community Food Bank of New Jersey, we were just over 50 million meals. And that was a milestone year right before the pandemic. Now we are at 85 million meals and we have a plan to sustain that over the, in the next three years at least as we bring things back in balance. Uh, we address, we also know that hunger and, and we recognize that hunger is also a health issue. So we want to make sure that it's not just food, that uh, any kind of food that we're providing and food that, in fact, if not done correctly, can lead to a health crisis later. But we look at making sure that there's nutritional value in the food uh, and that that food does uh, actually helps a person live an active and healthy lifestyle. So to that extent, all the food that we provide, out of all of the food that we provide, we're providing not 24 million pounds, but now actually more than 35 million pounds is what we're planning to provide this year and did last year as well. Uh, and we also learn how to uh, connect uh, families to other resources as we find them in our vast network of pantries and soup kitchens and other not-for-profits that we work with. All of this food does not get handed out to the better part of the hundreds of thousands of New Jerseyans that are in need from our two locations. We work through a network of different programs throughout the state, food pantries, soup kitchens, and other not-for-profits that rely on us to be able to get them their meal. Uh, while we do that, we also uh, provide a number of other different um, services that I'll touch on a little later. But one that I like to really highlight is that as we're preparing meals, in some cases we prepare meals for children, for seniors, and for other targeted populations, we also leverage uh, our operational capacity to teach others a skill. So we have a, a food uh, training academy that we started over 20 years ago. And it helps provide some of those meals, but more importantly, it gives culinary training to some folks in our immediate area and allows and, and also provides them with life skills and then allows them to go to work um, in uh, uh, different culinary settings throughout the state. And it's a way for them to rebuild themselves and get more economically mobile and more uh, food secure themselves. That program has graduated over 2,500 students in its history. Uh, over the last uh, 20 or so years. And more importantly, it's helped us maintain a high level of effectiveness and efficiency while producing some of the meals that we do. We like to innovate and leverage that way. Another example of how we leverage uh, resources and invite uh, folks to be a part of our solution is our volunteerism. We have over 44 
thousand hours of volunteers that help fuel this and other things that we do uh, to respond to the problem. And as I mentioned, we leverage other not -for and provide uh, value to other not-for-profits who are looking to or need food to be able to uh, provide this in the community. Let me quickly just give you a, 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 just a quick description of uh, where the, what types of programs, as I mentioned. By, by far, most of our food finds its way to local pantries. So if there's a pantry serving a, any part of any community in the 15 counties that we serve, chances are they're getting food from us. And if not, you should really ask why not? Because what we do is harness food from three major distribution streams that I'll talk about uh, in a second and make sure that that bundle is reflective of what the community needs. So that's, that's our kind of our golden and our approach. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it has grown just shy of four, 50 million meals provided in, in fiscal 17. As you can see now, uh, 85 million meals, which is about 112 million pounds of food uh, is what we uh, provided last fiscal year. And we're on track to do that again this fiscal year. Comes from three main sources of food. We uh, are soliciting food and procuring food from anywhere in the food stream. Literally a farm, a gr the ground in a farm, um, or your cupboards if you're providing, uh, participating in a food drive, but more and but more, uh, more comprehensively working with retail stores and anywhere warehouses where food may be available for donation. So donated product is a key part of what we've been doing. And even since the pandemic, we've been increasing the amount of donated food as a proportion of the, the total basket of, of product that we, uh, that we give out. Government commodities is the second one. So part of the, the farm bill and in, in USDA uh, government, federal government policy uh, administered by the Department of Agriculture is to actually buy commodities from farmers. It's a way to help stabilize pricing. And as part of that stabilization, it's provided uh, to food banks to be able to distribute uh, into the community. And I'm oversimplifying a little bit of that policy uh, for the sake of, of the presentation. And then third, but certainly not least in this environment is purchasing product. And that's that yellow band you see there. So we went from no more than 17% uh, being provided. And some of that was like a co-op that we ran for some of our partners to now 40% of the food that we have to provide to make our basket whole uh, is actually purchased. Uh, some of it is purchased with government dollars. A lot of it is purchased also uh, with private dollars as well. And, and so we, we depend on all sectors of society to be able to make our initiatives whole. And you can see the upward stream. And if you remember the first line graph that I showed you, we have to maintain that just to take care of the basic need of food, which is so important. As I mentioned, big focus on produce. If you look at the produce growth um, just over the last couple of years, it's certainly climbed up from 25 to now 35 million uh, last year and again this year. Uh, same mix, uh, much more donated um, of, of produce, fresh produce from farms and from different areas, but a big purchasing uh, growth as well for produce. The purchasing is quite innovative. We're actually working more and more with local cooperatives and local uh, wholesalers to be able to get some of New Jersey's, the Jersey Garden, of uh, the Garden uh, State's produce into the hands of our neighbors that needed the most. So there's been a lot of innovation in terms of how we procure produce in this space. Um, as I mentioned, hunger is a health issue. So we look, everything that we do, we know that it's not a standalone problem, right? We think sometimes very dichotomously and a very siloed mentality as a society. Um, you're, and, but as we discussed, food is not just a symptom, food insecurity is not just a symptom of not having food. There's food all around us. It's that access to food that we really have to understand. And we have to help families kind of climb out of this uh, uh, dire need to be food secure and help them manage through those devastating um, realities that we talked about earlier. So one way that we do that is by seeing hunger as a health issue and really, since so many chronic diseases, diseases have a food uh, component to it, we like to what we call pair or layer, not just food, but deliver it in a way that meets, uh, let's say, a diabetic uh, population where, it, where they are. 
and provide them with the right nutrition so that they can then have optimal uh, response to their diabetes, make, help give them food to at least have some consistency access, and then they can work on the next thing, kind of climbing back up to that path of economic mobility, if you would. And so there's a whole slew of different initiatives that we do that, that you can say come together or programming that comes together to define an initiative in a way that helps us understand that hunger is a health issue. And if we don't treat it that way, then we might be giving someone food, but we are not really helping them climb up uh, that, that path of economic mobility that they need to to become food secure on their own. Uh, nutrition education, a lot of what we do is also familiarizing and it goes hand in hand with hunger as a health issue, helping uh, neighbors familiarize themselves with product that they're not used to. I remember uh, walking uh, through a pantry with a neighbor uh, in need and her two children, and she was all excited when we got to the fresh produce. She was grabbing these green, uh, these yellow beans that I had never seen before and telling me how she prepared it. And then she walked right by the eggplant. And I'm like, children don't like eggplant? I have so many recipes that I enjoy and my children enjoy with eggplant. She says, I never had one. And it was something not familiar to her, uh, either culturally or as growing up. So part of what our nutrition education team does is they prepare recipes, they work with our local pantries, make recipes available, sometimes do tastings. And what I heard afterwards is that she is now grabbing eggplants and enjoying them with her family. Families will not take something that they're not familiar because no one wants to be wasteful, especially if you're in need. And so it's a good way to kind of pair, um, introduce different product, but also if you help you understand what the nutritional value of certain products are so that you can make better sense and better balance of what food is available to you for your nutrition needs. Uh, we really are focusing on reducing emergency food needs. So wh what does that say, simply put? We want less people to show up at pantries. Our goal is for people to show up less at pantries. Um, and that sounds really nice and really catchy as a slogan, but then the next question should be, what are you doing about it? Because what we've seen and what we now know, and we've always known it, at least theoretically, is hunger is a solvable problem. And food insecurity is a solvable problem. It's a political condition and a societal condition at most. There's enough food around us. We have a huge food waste problem, as a matter of fact, that we've been rescuing and redirecting. So it's not a resource problem, it's that access problem or that, that, uh, that need to help families climb back up, um, become more economically mobile to, to do that. And there's some tangible ways that we actually do that. First and foremost is uh, we talk about the problem that way. Create awareness. <laughs> People understand, when we understand the difference between hunger and food insecurity, that's perspective. When you understand that it is the shortcoming of a bunch of resources um, that then lead folks to show up to a pantry, then you know your way back out. When you understand that you have to deal with devastating barriers that are created by food insecurity, like health, like trauma, and so on, then you at least know how to meet a person where they are. Um, and help them navigate to, to that more food insecure place that is possible. And we can also help connect families to very tangible resources like SNAP. We provide um, SNAP assistance that have helped increase SNAP participation in the state and that where, where we directly uh, help uh, families enroll uh, into the SNAP program if they have a hard time navigating through it. Um, through, through direct assistance and by showing up at pantries and other uh, locations and helping families kind of navigate through that. And that helps bring in millions of dollars of federal dollars into the state and into the local community. Uh, and we've also did, we used to do, we don't do as, uh, um, uh, as much anymore, some energy assistance as well. Um, all of which help bring in millions of dollars, not to the food bank, but into the hands of neighbors uh, that need it most. I mentioned our workforce development program. It is an interesting way to take our operational ability and needs and translate, it, translate them into something productive for our neighbors, which is an opportunity to learn uh, for them and to re-engage into the workforce. Again, helping them climb back up to that place of economic mobility as well. All of our students uh, have, 90% uh, of our students uh, graduate from the program in, the, in a 14 week program. And most of the, and, and just as many of them have a job at the 30, 60, and 90 day mark 
which is the, the traditional benchmarks for workforce development. I see some folks shaking their head. We are gonna be adding to that component to really test the sticking power and to help identify hopefully what other barriers exist by trying to keep in touch with at least a sampling of students, maybe at the year point out. Um, a lot of students do find themselves back to us at the five year mark because all the students leave with something called surf safe certification and then they have to be recertified in five years. So if they're still in food industry, which is not, a, which is not an implied goal of the program, the program is designed to get you into the workplace through culinary training, but we don't need you to, how many of us started in, in some kind of culinary uh, aspect where we were wor working, waiting tables, in college, probably all, many of us did that. Uh, I, I stayed in food differently, but I think many of us maybe went on to something else. So this is really a path for folks to get back into the, into the workforce. Um, one of the ways that we've kind of really transformed ourselves is by really using data uh, and helping us inform what we do. So you notice that I started the presentation with numbers, and then I filled those numbers out with a little bit of understanding of what our community looks like. We have 650,000 New Jerseyans, other than be, that are food insecure. Other than that, they look very different in every sense of the word. Some are working, some are retired, some are parents, some are children. They might be in different uh, parts of their um, uh, life cycle, if you would. So understanding the need in that way, the, ge the geography, the demographic diversity of food insecurity helps us be more relative and responsive to the problem. In addition to that, um, we want to hear. It's not just quantitative data that we're looking for. It's qualitative information. When you listen to your neighbors, they tell you exactly what it is that they need to get successful. They're waiting for it. They're, still, they're hungry for that. Not, not as much for the food per, per se, but they're hungry for that opportunity to get back on their feet and get back on track. I was amazed uh, in October. I had the privilege of attending the White House Conference on Food, on, on food Health, and Hunger. Uh, I was amazed that I was talking to a neighbor that was going through lived experiences of food insecurity um, just the night before and that her morning. And she was very articulate as to what she needed to get back on track and what her challenges were and how she needed certain things to just line up differently. I was floored when the president of the United States got on stage and said the exact same thing. When we listen to our neighbors, then we can define business strategies and policies that make sense and have an impact. And I think that's part of how we use data. Learn about what's really happening. Um, um, add to that uh, some qualitative element of what our neighbors are saying. And then we can develop business strategies that make sense. Otherwise, um, our, we might be placing a different value structure to our, to our strategy. And um, it's probably not going to have the impact that it could. And then second, but certainly not least, uh, is to work with our network. We have... We don't touch people directly across in the scale that we do through our community partners. They're seeing how communities are evolving, um, how they're, what their needs are, and can provide additional insights to us as to how to, how to leverage what we have and bring extra value uh, to us. When we add all those three things, it allows us to do a couple of very simple, very tangible um, uh, things, not only be responsive and relevant, uh, but do identify gaps in our service. Uh, we don't want to spread our services flatly like peanut butter. Need is, uh, as I mentioned, very different. So you want to be able to apply the right resources in the right community for the person in a way that's going to help them uh, in, in a very meaningful way. It also helps us leverage tremendous areas of opportunity um, by thinking creatively. Think of our food service training academy it's not only providing uh, the, the most impactful thing that we can do, which is uh, give families uh, and individuals rather a means to go work, but it's helping us produce meals that then have uh, another uh, impact uh, to certain community members. Um, and in doing so and understanding the problem this way, we can start correcting for inequities in our society because things do land the way they land for whatever reasons, um, perhaps, and, and, and certainly root, uh, some root causes of inequities um, and of societal issues do have uh, uh, do need some correcting. These, these, are, these are societal problems that have contributed to the inequities and the food insecurities, not a lack of food, as, as, as we've talked about. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, since we're at time, 
what you can do and how you can engage. So to our, our programs team, we can actually, uh, we, we can, we can, you can do a field trip. Joe, Joe's very well versed in what a field trip uh, to the food bank uh, can do and how you can engage. And so today I want you to think about three things that you can do to help to make sure that your neighbors can be more food secure. The first thing I'm gonna ask you to do is tell the story. Tell the story of what food security is versus hunger and what the reality for so many hundreds of thousands of our neighbors actually is. You do that, you're, being, you're doing a tremendous service to help dispel myths and to help people focus on, um, and the beginnings of helping to people focus on what's a very solvable problem. The second thing you can do is lend one of two things. The second and third thing that you can do is lend one of two things, your time and your treasure. 95 cents of every dollar helps support all of the things that we mentioned and more. Uh, and so you can, be, you can rest assured that a dollar uh, is leveraged with other resources from, uh, from uh, private sector and government se sector alike to real, really fuel the response that we talked about here today. And if you're so inclined, uh, uh, donate your time. Uh, come by the food bank. You'll probably see Joe there um, on a couple days a week and really get your hands into the work that we do by helping to sort food, pack meal packs, uh, and, um, and, and be able to uh, really engage with the solutions that we talked about here as well. And depending on where you are in the state, uh, you can do that either in our facility or you can do that in a mobile uh, site and some of the mobile distributions that we actually hold there as well. And Lauren Schneider is here. She's gonna stay here a little bit after as well. And, um, and she'll take questions and uh, can, can help talk about maybe next steps in organizing. But I am going to stop there because we're at time and I wanna be able to take questions from folks in the room or uh, in the virtual room. Thank you. Uh, our uh, way of doing this at present is if you have a question, you'll be recognized and then you'll have to come up to the front so that the microphone for Zoom can hear you. Uh, so uh, have we questions, you raise your hand or uh, questions online. Uh, let's start with online or Paul, you I'm have something. We're in the meeting with a hand up. So Carlos, this, this is a, a wonderful story and it's amazing work that you people are doing. I, I, it just blows my mind, this plus what we heard last week. I um, mean, you know, people are doing important work here. And, and I, I've been watching this from the sidelines for a long time, being a resident of Summit and actually a member of Christchurch where a lot of this stuff happens, you know, it's sort of it's an incubator for these programs. And uh, over the years, our, you know, church group, our you know, youth groups and whatnot, and even adults would would do uh, uh, trips to the food bank to to help with sorting. So I, you know, you're suggesting uh, individuals could do this. And uh, a qu one quick question about that: if somebody wants to go there and maybe take their wife or something and volunteer for a while, uh, do you have to call them and tell them you're coming and ha have an appointment, or do you just show up? You could address that. I would also point out that since I've seen this happen, you could talk this up at your church or house of worship and, you know, get a group of people passionate about it and go as a group. I'm sure you would appreciate that. And the other thing is, uh, I was, you know, involved on the ground a little bit, but I found a way to donate to this organization, which, which was mind blowing. They, they were, they do a great job with uh, fundraising across the board and getting federal money and state money and so on and so forth and individual contributions. And they used to, and maybe still do run a big fundraiser in the fall called the blue jean ball and i went to this a few times and it was just an amazing party and in a way it's sort of uh ironic that you know an organization that is focusing on food insecurity is having a ball where everybody's eating plentifully but the vendors serving the food there were actually vendors who were involved in the program and supporting it so it's reasonable for people who are actually trying to solve this problem to get together and have a wonderful party. So if you're still doing that, that's a nut, you know, it's a fundraiser. So it costs a little bit of money to go, but that's a wonderful way to get involved. Are you still doing that? We are. And it's, it's in this, 
we are still doing the Blue Jean Bowl. It's in the spring, and it's uh, scheduled for the spring as well. But I love the idea of coming together as a group, whether it's this group or your church group or any other civic or, or family or, or religious organization that you may be a part of and uh, scheduling a day ahead of time because we do book up and Lauren uh, can help give more information on how to do that. Have we another question in the hall? Question online? Jim Glenn here. Yes, uh, last night on New Jersey Spotlight News, they had a story that talked about food insecurity, uh, about the New Jersey Economic uh, Development Association uh, coming up with two and a half million dollars in grants um, for food retailers to apply for up to $250,000 to set up some kind of food storage locations in 15 New Jersey food deserts. And I just wondered if that's something you were uh, aware of and involved in. So the short answer is yes. Uh, we helped push that policy and inform that policy that the governor enacted a couple of years ago. And it's been um, uh, already producing some change. There's Atlantic City, if you know Atlantic City, had no food um, supermarket, any large scale supermarket at all. So one of the initiatives under that is to, uh, they broke ground on a, on a supermarket that should be built in a couple of years. And another key component is the dollars that your grants that you mentioned, anyone receiving, any retailer receiving that, uh, they have to make sure that they accept SNAP and WIC. And that's something that we directly advocated for and, and introduced in the legislature. It's hard to be food secure if it costs you three times as much to go find the food and you're on limited resources. And, and that's kind of one of those things that we're, we're very grateful is a big policy initiative uh, for our administration. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for a wonderful talk. Um, you mentioned in passing that there's a lot of food waste um, what can one do? I, mean, I think this distribution, these 15 distribution networks is probably a great idea because probably the logistics are one of the biggest issues. But um, what can one do to um, reduce uh, food waste? Well, the first thing is awareness. Uh, uh, if you find that you don't want, you no longer want something, uh, make sure that you know whether it's still good or not. Much, much of the dates on the food do not mean that the food goes bad on that date. Even milk, the cow is just not that specific. It actually has a shelf life. And so that's part of the education campaign that we first go to re retailers and manufacturers. That's how we get a lot of donated product and say, look, if it doesn't meet your market standards, it is still way, uh, uh, very much usable and we can uh, rescue it and put it to work. So the other part is for you personally, there's a great campaign that we were a part of with the state. Uh, it's a more food, less waste campaign. You can find it on the NJDA website. And it actually goes on to dispel a lot of the myths about a use by date and expiration date and so on. And New Jersey was kind of cutting edge and leading in making this a major campaign. This is something that uh, the federal government is also looking at because like, we buy things and then throw it out thinking it's no longer good. And that's a that actually drives up more sales, higher costs, and has a, a downstream effect. Never mind you're wasting product that you can easily make available to, to a neighbor. More up. questions online? Oh, here's one. Yeah, following up on the uh, food waste. So it's midnight, the kitchen's closed at, give, at a restaurant and there's leftovers cooked, uncooked, et cetera. Walk us through what the supply chain on what happens at, starting at midnight. So food, prepared food is not a high source of donations compared to what we receive. It's the non-prepared food that normally is something where we focus our attention on. 
we do work with some partners and have worked with some partners in the prepared uh, food space. Think of a caterer, perhaps a restaurant. Many restaurants save product uh, if it's still food safe. A lot of safety concerns on prepared uh, product. And then there's a way to handle that where then it could be available the next morning for a donation if you pack it a certain way. Um, it's a higher touch exercise um, and it's not a tremendous amount of food because uh, restaurants and caterers that have a lot of leftovers are not restaurants or caterers for long. Um, and, I, and that's something we've learned through our 30 or 40 years and that they've learned. Manufacturing, the same thing, actually. There's less and less, uh, there's more and more on-time manufacturing which means there's less and less donations of product that's already manufactured. We still, we, we work with retail stores a lot because that's really uh, almost like the last, one of the few uh, remaining abundance areas for, um, for, for donated product that is still consumable. Uh, Steve? Uh, Carlos, thank you for a great presentation, but more importantly, for the good work that uh, you and your colleagues are doing. One thing that struck me in your presentation was right toward the beginning, you talked about the fact that food insecurity basically has taken 10 years to get back to where it was before the Great Depression. And that, uh, that stuck with me. Uh, and in particular, it's inconsistent with other measures we often look at, such as things in uh, growth and per uh, capita disposable income. What is it about that or how is it measured or, or how do you determine it and why is it so persistent once a recession occurs? Steve, thank you for that question. I think it's probably one of the most important things we can, we can focus on. Uh, why does it take so long for someone to climb out of food insecurity once something outside of their control happens um, like the recession in 2008? Well, let's take the pandemic as an example of two things. One, what happened, and, and two, what, how, we can, how, we, how we helped it becoming uh, much worse than it was predicted to be. Uh, what happened? Government shut down. The, the economy shut down. The government didn't shut down. The economy shut down uh, in 2020, in early 2020. And in a, almost immediately, in a couple of weeks, or what you can measure in paychecks, people started uh, to feel to feel like to really need and be food insecure, not be able to uh, either pay their rent, pay other expenses and put food on the table. So this concept of many families living paycheck to paycheck is very real. Even before the pandemic, uh, it was stated that most households could not deal with a $400 economic shock. That wasn't Carlos saying it, that was a major economic report and analysis that came out nationally. I think Reuters reported on it among some other uh, business entities as well. And that's the reality. Many families, this is a high cost of living area, but many families are living. I literally met families on those food lines that you saw throughout the news over the last couple of years that told me I did everything right. I had a couple of months saved up for rent and here I am because those okay. things are so the economic uh, reality that builds for them is more debt, whether it's rent arrears, perhaps um, other forms of debt kind of mounting up. And when they get back to work, is the work the same? Is it the same type of income and living uh, that, they, that they had before? If it is, they still have to climb out of that and deal with the arrears of payments is what we're, what we're seeing now in mass. And I think that's what paints the picture of why it takes so long. You, now, one thing that we've never had is also an inflationary period the way we're having now, ever, um, where it increased more need and also made the response to that need more expensive with the purchasing that we've had to do. So just as families were getting back to work, everything costs more. Um, and the resources are higher and uh, uh, it commands a higher premium in terms of cost to be able to just take your child to childcare or just put food on the table. I think we all know from our last supermarket trip. Answer your question, Steve. Thank you. Question. Online, Jim Barry. Good morning, everyone. I'm Megan Barry, Jim Barry's daughter. My dad's here with me. And our question is, I know that uh, ShopRite, Wakeburn Foods, has a uh, free turkey or free lasagna, free 
ham, kosher chicken uh, at the holidays during the year. And I'm wondering if there is a way that Wakeburn could load something into their pin tag or at the registers where customers could donate their item. And that way, logistically for them even, to go from their DC to your DC as you described, that would save logistical costs, labor costs, but to also be able to donate in a very meaningful way. I'm sure a lot of people would love to do that. That's a great question and a great point uh, that deserves uh, highlighting. Our food industry partners, Wake Fern and all the major brands, whether they're national brands or local state brands or regional brands, have been partners with the community food bank since day one, Wake Fern in particular. Uh, since, since day one of the food bank's existence. And they work with us in a number of different ways, uh, donations at their kind of distribution centers, at their retail stores, family owned um, uh, uh, brands also uh, provide philanthropic support to the food bank as well. And they're not the only ones, as I mentioned, all the food industry partners are, are heavily engaged with us. And during the pandemic where there were tremendous and unimaginable supply chain issues, they actually uh, created access for us to their suppliers so that we can um, either purchase when we had dollars to purchase or uh, get extra uh, product for donations as well. So thank you for that. Food industry partner uh, partners continue, continue to be a, a, a major part of our response. Uh, yes, come up. So I'm attending as a guest today, so I hope guests are allowed to ask questions. <laughs> uh, Carlos, a question for you. Um, in terms of the services that you provide, uh, if an uh, organization is trying to establish a community food bank or a community pantry, what services do you provide that could sort of serve as a blueprint for that organization to be successful if they're just starting this journey? So that's a great question. And actually during the pandemic, we had to reimagine and, um, and invite new entities to become partners in, in, in our efforts to become more food secure. Uh, I'm gonna invite you to visit our website at cfbnj.org. And uh, there's a number of different resources and a whole department, our network relations department that facilitate recruitment and onboarding of new pantries. The first thing we're gonna look at is how many programs are there in the community that you're proposing? Uh, because we don't need, uh, we, we wanna make sure that we're as effective as, and efficient as possible. Um, and sometimes it means adding programs, other times it means uh, helping programs with their capacity or partners with their capacity, which we've been doing a lot over the last couple of years uh, in terms of uh, multi-million dollar investment grants, capacity grants to the a uh, greater part of the 800 partners that we provide. So there's a couple different ways uh, to do that. Um, reach out to our network relations team uh, or to me and I can connect you. And, uh, and then we can explore the community that you're, that you're thinking about. Uh, there's an opportunity for one more question. Okay, uh, I'd like to call Mike back up to Thank our speakers. Just, just let it hang. Mm -hmm. yeah. Carlos, uh, many of the pantries have their own resources. Um, what percentage of their leads do you normally supply? Great question, Michael. Um, we estimated upwards of 75 to 80% of the food resources are coming from the food bank directly. Um, so if you think about the percentage of food, now it does vary. Not all pantries have their own resources. Sometimes the resources that they have are dedicated rightfully so to keeping the lights on and to doing the things that they need to just to be able to house and invite uh, our neighbors. And so those pantries may have a higher uh, percentage of need for our, for our food resources. Others can do both. They might be in a more well-off community and they can uh, supplement with what they give and give a little bit more and or run other programs. 
So it does range. The last study we did was a while ago, but what we can tell from some surveying that we've done is 75 to 80% on average is probably what they depend on us for. And now they're depending more and more on us to help them with their capacity. So the freezers, the refrigeration and other equipment so they can also grow the way we've grown. We didn't just, we had to do a lot to go from you know, 15 million meals of food um, to, a hundred, to a 85 million meals of food, change our refrigeration, our logistics. So we're helping investing them through grants and helping them with technical assistance and, and other resources so they can do the same downstream. No other questions? That's it. So I'm gonna take a moment to just say thank you to everyone for uh, inviting us here today and talk a little bit about the problem of food insecurity and how we go about solving it. I invite you to be a part of the solution and I'll leave you with this. These programs make a difference. Um, you can believe, believe it because of the narrative that I shared with you today, or you can believe it because I myself am a recipient of a lot of these programs during times where my parents had hardship growing up. Um, I am first generation everything. Uh, my, I grew up in the South Bronx. Both my parents were working households for during times of economic hardships. It was these very programs, summer meals, school meals, and an occasional trip to the pantry that allowed me to be the first one to graduate from college, grad school, and stand here privileged to be your CEO. Thank you. Lauren, everybody. <laughs> you didn't get a chance to talk, but that's okay. You know, that's important. And you volunteered. Okay, a couple of ways we have of honoring you. One is a certificate here. <laughs> Okay, the Old Guard was formed in 1930. Uh, back then, Summit was known as the orchid capital of the United States. Uh, there are a lot of orchid growers here. In fact, the last one left in 1975, I believe, and uh, they went down to Georgia, and the site became affordable housing. Uh, the the other way we have of thanking you is the All Guard Salute. 